This time then we're going to present to you the meaning of the gift of self. We will start first of all with a little story, an anecdote from my own personal life. I was a very small boy. My mother had been widowed. I'd lost my daddy, I think somewhere within a year or two of the date of the story. I can't fix the exact year in my mind. But I slept on a little cot up under the eaves in an upstairs room. And it was night, and I woke up, frightened. And I ran across the hall, went over to my mother's room, and I crawled into bed with my mother. As most people do, they run to their mother, bless the mother's hearts of the world, they run to their mother for comfort. And I went for comfort to her. But do you know why? This is the important thing. I went there because I was pondering upon when life started. And I became frightened at the vastness of it all. What I could see, what was visible to my eyes, what I was able to behold of life, which I knew was a very small segment of life. And yet it seemed to me as a child that the mysteries of life and of death, the mysteries of being, the mysteries that were the mysteries of mysteries, was God. And I was thinking about this as a small boy when suddenly I asked myself that question that all masters shun and never answer. Who created God? And as I asked myself this question, I became more and more frightened by it. Hence, my running to my mother for physical comfort because I was scared. It may seem strange to you that a small boy of that age would be in any way concerned about such weighty and intense problems. Nevertheless, this was me. I was concerned with this problem. Somehow or other, I feel that if they will admit it, everyone has been afraid of the dark at some time or other. Everyone has had, at some era of their lives, a question about the eternal verities. The rock of Gibraltar that is so solid, so spiritual, so real, that many people in the vagaries of life never seem to consult with the spiritual side of their existence. What most people do is think about what are we going to do today for fun? And this is a perfectly normal thing for children. And this becomes more and more involved. And then comes the subject of the bottomless pit. That was another thing which I was worried about and concerned. What is the bottomless pit? I could understand a very deep barrel, but somehow or other I couldn't quite imagine anything, any kind of a barrel that didn't have a bottom in it. But I was face to face with the scriptures, and the scriptures told me that there was a bottomless pit, and I believed it. And there is. And I have never seen the bottomless pit any greater than man's desires and the vagaries of his desires or the extent of his imagination. 
which is a true bottomless pit. We can envision a cornucopia, and we can envision this cornucopia filled with fruit, and we can see it as the cruise of Elijah's oil that never faileth. We can think of the abundance of God coming out of the horn of plenty, but a bottomless pit makes us shudder, and it should, because it will never be full. We can eat, and we will be hungry. We can drink, and we will thirst. We can seek to be filled with righteousness, and we will never be full of righteousness. We can seek everything. We will never find it, except we have the water that the Master spoke of, saying, He that drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst again. This shows a a very wide fixation, a wide gulf between the realities of man and the actualities of God. The realities of man are what seems real to us as individuals, but the actualities of God are telling it like it is. And in telling it like it is, we have to understand what the meaning of the gift of self is and selfhood. So you have a birth certificate a baby shoe and a little footprint that says you were born here or you were born there of such and such a parents that your name is John Smith or Mary Jones. You are so old, you weighed so much, you were so long and all of the vital statistics about yourself. These are not really important except as memory items, things we like to retain just for sentimental value. When we ponder today to consider the gift of self, we must pause to consider from the standpoint of the Creator, of His intent. We read clearly in the scriptures that God is a spirit. Has anyone told you that you are something else? If you were made in the image of God, you must be a spirit also. And if a spirit then as long ago in the razor's edge that Somerset Maughan wrote, one of the principal characters comes out and visits the great mystic in the Shambhala of the story, and we find that as he stands before this ancient of days, almost the ancient of days, this wise but wrinkled old man of the spirit with the fading flesh and the fresh light of youth in his eyes, that suddenly he reaches out and he speaks of an ocean and he dips his finger in perhaps a laver, a bowl, a bronze laver, and he brings out on his finger one glistening drop of water. It hangs there suspended in the air like a diamond shining in the sun. And he compares this image to the soul of the individual man as compared to the ocean of God divinity. Today, we are face to face in the religious world with those who hold various dogmas interpreting the progress of the soul, a form of John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. We see all of the austere marches of people in their various roles of everything from saint to the vilest of sinner. And then we pause to consider that in the meaning of the gift of self, we were all created by the self-same spirit. And we ask ourselves this question. Is dogma important or is it unimportant? No, I wouldn't say in my giving answer that it is unimportant. Certainly we need the security of established dogmas. Man has needed that or else he would not have created it. 
but we need it in the same manner that a child needs a crib or a high chair. For beyond dogma is the simplistic concept of pristine manhood, the gift of self. Simply put, the scriptures record that Jesus said he knew that he came forth from God and he knew that he would return to God. In all of the search that man has for the living truth and the living God, he often loses sight of the sweet and pure concepts that the master envisioned and brought forth. I recall many years ago having an experience of meeting a lady who was a Lutheran lady. Now far be it from me to decry the Lutheran church or the Catholic church or any church. That's not my intent in this lecture. But this lady was schooled in her church and in its doctrine and its dogma. And she was telling me about a child that was born and then was not baptized by its parents. And according to her belief and her concept, that child would wind up, even at that early age, should the child die, in the fires of hell and torment. Now you understand what I am talking about. For there are many dogmatic presentations and analyses of religious techniques, doctrines, and the hereafter that clearly show that people are concerned with what may happen to them without pledging faith in the justice and the mercies of God. Can you conceive of a God that thunders from horror that is without mercy? Can you conceive of a God, or even of yourself, if you are a fair and kind person, who would allow, and I'll use this word, allow a human being made in your image, if you were God, to be cast as a tiny baby into a seething inferno? Or would you, any of you, cast one of your children into an oven, no matter what your child might have done. For there are the gamut of human crimes, the, the things that people can do. Among these, of course, are murder and rapine, theft, lies, and so forth. But are any of them in actuality in your own mind, even now, worthy of being burned in the fires of Hades. I'll tell you why I say that and why I ask that question. I ask that question because I do not believe that any human being on the face of this earth would commit these crimes if they knew the justice, the wisdom, the mercy, and the love of God. I believe it is primarily a matter of self-concerns that blind us to what is the reality of our Father who is in heaven. If we stop to think about it, God is not interested in preserving for us life on earth so that we may go to the county fair, for example, and win the first prize. To us, it may be a very nice happening to win the first prize. But these are all matters that occur in this world rather than in the next. They are not matters of destiny. You go ahead and fatten the fattest calf, the nicest calf, get the blue ribbon. You go ahead and bake the nicest cake and you tell me how that is going to successfully get you to heaven nor will that specific little thing or any other human thing that you do involve you in the living God, in his purposes. But from a practical standpoint, I would like to impart such little wisdom as God has given me by saying 
that I believe all of these things are permissible experiences which are intended by God to teach us various things about life and to ready us for the greater school. This life here is a kindergarten. Its experiences are kindergarten experiences. They are not the experiences of a high school. They are not the experiences of a spiritual college. They are not the experiences of a university or a postgraduate course. And we should not expect them to be. But we ought to so live here that in all things that we do, we pattern after our best understanding of God and Christ and the hereafter. We must not forget the present. For I believe that in the present we are either forging links in a chain that will bind us and prevent us from fully realizing our potential or we are forging links in a spiritual chain that is tethered to a divine star that is ever rising, ascending and that we are being pulled up literally by forces greater than ourselves into a heritage that we were bequeathed from the beginning and that ought to manifest in our life today. The relentless laws of karma regarded so by those who violate it, as the old Scotsman said, A long time ago, nay thief, e'er felt uh, had a good opinion o'er the law, whene'er he felt the halter draw. We do not like the laws of karma when they apply to ourselves as a recompense for something that we have done of a negative nature. We regret the impact of that upon our soul. But such chastening ought not to be so regarded, but rather to be perceived as the mercy of God. For would we rather have ourselves cast into the discard pile as the great master potter creating life on the molding wheel of life picks up the lump of clay that represents an individual and sees that he has an imperfect image. So he says, at this point, I'm just, for the benefit of those of you who are in other rooms, I'm just mashing my hands together and rolling the clay around. And then God just says, I'll put it over here and I'll remold it. Let's rework it. It isn't fit for consumption, for use. We should realize then that the continuing mercy of God, regardless of what religion we are born in, or whether we have none at all, is an application of the laws of heaven to we individuals that are embodied here on earth for the specific winning of our own freedom. If this were left to the dogmas of a religion or to the concepts that people hold, even quite near and dear, as so many do, and I did myself, for example, if I sat here in this room, let me see, hmm, probably about 35 years ago, I would have really not listened to myself because I would have thought perhaps in terms of heresy. And the same thing was brought to the Master Jesus. They came to him, complaining because he called himself the Son of God. He said he was the Son of God. And you know what happened? He gave answer to those that complained. And what was the answer? He said, if you can't accept, he said, the fact that I have said I am the Son of God, what are you going to do with the expression of Moses? When Moses spoke to the people and called them gods to whom the word of God was spoken. And he said, if he called them gods to whom the word of God was spoken, 
said, why do you find any fault with me if I say that I am the Son of God? He was affirming the principle of I am in the ancient Egyptian tongue, which means I am that I am. Or as the Hindus say, Om Tat Sat, which means the same thing. A rose known by any other name smells just as sweet. So the meaning of the gift of self is very great. And I will try today to pull the curtain aside that you may see who and what you are. You are a no one, and heaven and earth can deny it by theology or by any other means. You are gods in the sense that you belong to God. And you are gods in the sense that you are destined to become a god of your own universe. One who masters and takes dominion over your world. And when this is done universally, by all mankind, the kingdom of heaven will be a reality. And I will tell you why. Because in that day, Each man will sit under his own vine and fig tree. And he will not teach someone saying, Know the Lord. But as the ancient scriptures record, For all shall know me from the least unto the greatest. The problems of our world today are those of human ignorance concerning the laws of God. This is not an epitaph that I hurl carelessly at the world. For the world is God's world, and a lovely place at that. But there is much misunderstanding in the world of the values of life. Many make value judgments without understanding all of the facts. Many make value judgments that actually are defrauding judgments. They defraud people of their divine birthright so that people cannot understand themselves. First of all, let's take the statement, ye are gods, as made by Moses. Let's see if there is anything really wrong with that. Let's see indeed. The Bible says in the early Pentateuch, that the Lord God created man in his own image and his own likeness. This means a complete congruency, line for line, precept for precept, image for image. Geometrically, God and man were congruent. Now then, if God is the creator, and God made man in his own image, then what is wrong with saying that man is a potential God? Our scientists are now beginning to think theologically as well as scientifically. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? The answer is the infinite number because angels do not displace time or space. We are face to face at all times with relativity and we live in a scientific world today where our scientists tell us that the universe is expanding and they see this by star displacement and a moving as though the universe were painted on a balloon and then the balloon were held in the mouth of God and then God were blowing up the balloon, a little bit more air being inserted every year. So that space itself seems to distort and warp or expand, no doubt by plan. In the ancient Upanishads and other writings of the ancient Hindu civilizations, We learn about this dance of creation, how that creation moves forward and expands and then comes to a place where the cycle is complete 
and begins once again to be inhaled as it was exhaled into the nostrils of the divine in a sense, in effect. We can understand this because not only must there be everlasting expansion, but because we only rise so high in one cycle of civilization, we see the waves upon the graph of life as correspondent waves to a vast cosmic cycle above and beyond in the background. But we perceive that as above, so below, according to the ancient hermetic axiom. And therefore, these cycles rise so high. And the Germans have a saying that is quite interesting. They say the trees only grow so high. And so, the cycle expands and then contracts once again into itself, being called back into the Godhead as a seed might call back into itself an acorn seed, the great oak tree of manifestation. And all of life would expand as far as it could go in that cycle and then would come back once again into its dormant phase or cycle where it would rest in the consciousness of God. This may no doubt be part of the infinite plan to allow us in the cycle of manifestation, the manvantara, to see how things would go out into the process of creation and then would return back to the dormant cycle. Each cycle would supposedly rise higher than that which preceded it. And thus we would see a manifest form of transcendence in the universality of God, which makes a good deal of sense in reality, because somehow or other, the concept of the golden streets of paradise and the angels playing harps, while down below the great cosmic square or cube, somewhere in existence, we see a tortuous chamber presided over by Satan with a fiery hell being created, seems an utterly strange contrast that we cannot conceive of as real. There is no reality whatsoever in God backing or recognizing an authority other than the authority of the Godhead and the authority of the Holy Christ Self. The authority of the powers of darkness must terminate, for we read that Christ has the keys of hell and of death. And he says clearly in Revelation that he will cast hell and death and all those things that go with it into the bottomless pit where it shall be no more. As I read and understand this then, we see this as the annihilation of all that is not God that only manifested through the maya and the illusion of the human mind in its extensive manifestations that were indicated at the occasion of the Tower of Babel as existent. For at the time of the Tower of Babel, you'll recall a specific statement made by God to the angels. He said, and now, least man will go out and uh, do whatever he wants to do, he says, with his imagination. He said, we're going to confound the speech of the people because at that time Nimrod sought to build a tower, a universal tower to God, and he was going to reach heaven by that tower. Those of you who are familiar with the old ziggurats, who are familiar with the ancient buildings of Ur and the Chaldees, probably realize what I'm talking about. It probably seems ridiculous to modern man. But then, after all, there was a time when wisdom had reached a certain apex in the Chaldean Empire, in the Babylonian Empire, and various other empires of the ancient past. So we have to realize that with each year, man is able, hopefully, to clarify some of his concepts about the gift of self. 
And as the clouds are rolled away and a greater awareness of self replaces the darkness of self, we all become more like God because we see as we really are what we are. I believe it was St. Paul who said, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then shall we know, even as also we are known. There is nothing wrong in knowledge. It is true that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, but to have spiritual knowledge given to us by God and to use it to understand the deity to understand the harmony of our fellow men is to enhance the gift of selfhood and see selfhood as a doorway unto God. If it is not a doorway unto God, if it is merely an opportunity to expand the ego, then do not rejoice. For the ego has its three score days and ten. That is to say, even now, the life expectancy according to life insurance statistics is actually still around three score and ten. I'm not interested in hair splitting causistry. I'm not interested in trying to pin this right down to the ear and, and say how many eggs are consumed in America and then guess at it. Because you can quote statistics on anything. All I'm trying to do today in this lecture is make you aware of the value of your life. I want you to understand that your life is valuable to God and to Christ, above and beyond human dogmas and differences of opinion. Why, do you know the thing that convinced me many years ago of, of the truth of this was a certain argument that occurred between the gym director and the pastor of my church that I belonged to at that time. They got into such a swearing match at each other that I ran quickly and got my good friend Mrs. Beeston who was a prim and precise lady and my mother and I brought them secretly to the outside of the doorway where this terrible argument was going on and I said to them now you listen to that <laughs> and they were nearly shocked out of their skin because the man from whom they heard all about God on Sunday was now at swords points with the physical education director of the church. And this is a true story. But it is typical of life. The streets of life are not actually quiet. <laughs> They're not too peaceful. And many people are seething volcanoes of human emotion when in reality what we need is the peace of the living Christ that clearly understands the little understanding that came to Elisha when they were walking along. I believe this is correct. If I'm wrong, it was one of the prophets anyway. Part of the family, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, they were really worried because they heard all the saber rattling. And it seemed as if all of the armies of the enemy was coming against the little Israelite community. They were about to be swamped and destroyed. And so the prophet said, as he prayed to God, he says, open his eyes that he may see. And he opened his eyes and there camped all around the city were the Lord's hosts, the angelic hosts, and he saw the great burnishing of their chariots and their magnificent cosmic swords that they hold in their hand. Now this happens to be true. An old Bible that was in the home of my grandmother contained a picture of one of these angels holding what looked like a very elongated broomstick. Many years later, I was able to establish contact with the masters and see that this was in the Akashic records an actual sword that was an electrode. The sword was an electrode for the cosmic energy generated in the heart of the angels. And it was very powerful. 
and was very, very real. It was electronic, it was like electricity. It flowed, and it flowed from the end of this sword, and it created tremendous riptides of light. And it was very beneficial to mankind because when they got surrounded by legions of darkness, when the angels came then with these swords and stretched them out, the darkness fled because the darkness hated the light. And this is perfectly true with cosmic law. Some of you are aware of the fact that I was origin of Alexandria. You recall the charges that were leveled against me very early in Christianity and how I was imprisoned for many years as a result of the church's condemnation. But the important thing is that people understand that there are angels and that they are just as much a part of the Lord's camp as we are, I think more so, in a way because they don't die or change their garments. They are very powerful beings they do whatever God's will is, whereas we sometimes don't know what God's will is. And in such a quandary as that, we may kick against the pricks as did St. Paul. St. Paul was a wonderful soul. He believed in himself. He believed in God. He believed in everything but Jesus Christ. And he was going along with great zeal carrying chains to bind the early Christians. When he heard the words from heaven, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And then it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The thing that we all must remember is that our salvation is not in the summit lighthouse. Our salvation is not in Mark Prophet. Our salvation is not in your church, it is not in your political party, it is not in the dollars you have or don't have in the bank. Your salvation is in your divine Christhood. For we see the pattern in the gift of self of the logos or the word. Iman fang vor das vort und das vort war bei Gott und Gott vor das vort. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and God was the Word. The transfer of the authority of the Godhead or Spirit then in the cycles of creation was to create a mental picture God created a picture according to the system. He drew in his mind God's energy ordained magnificently. Energy tries geometry. The abbreviation. God's energy created in mind and in spirit. And then he released that energy through the Christ that was from the foundation of the world, the power of the Logos was released and then there came into manifestation birds and creeping things and the earth and the firmament, but not only the firmament of this earth or this mud ball in space but also the whole expanding garment of God, which we call the macrocosm. The macrocosm is an image of yourself. Each of you are a microcosm. And the gift of life, the gift of self, enables you to contact the macrocosm or the spirit in the fourth dimensional patterns of the macrocosm and bring down what we may call a relationship between the macrocosm and the microcosm of the self. 
And for what purpose? For the purpose of identification of every monadic expression of the deity with the whole. Thus the unity of God is established. And it is established nowhere else except in yourself. For by a pin pricked upon the medulla oblongata, your life is extinguished and you breathe and function no more in your present body. So where is your life? But in God. So the gift of self and the meaning of that gift is very great because we are not here to win the races at Hialeah. We're not here just to have fun alone. We are here because of the serious business of establishing ourselves in the Godhead as a part of it. Now this is kind of strange because Actually, you are already established in the Godhead, just like the Christmas tree lamps. You have the Christmas tree lamps that we call a series circuit. And every bulb, every body bulb of every person fitting into the socket feels the current of life flowing through them and the body bulb glows with the vibrancy of some relative state of health. And there's one great big circle. And that circle has room in it for all the people on this earth or anywhere in cosmos. And it's connected to the great dynamo of spirit. And when a man vanishes from the screen of life as though he were no more than a little vapor on the window vanishing away, it's like disconnecting the bulb from the socket but the current keeps on flowing around the whole circuit. And that's what's coming down in the sky now, is the lightning. It's the electricity of God. Now I established for myself the fact that these things are true when I went to Rome. I stood before the spot where St. Peter had stood when Christ appeared to him. And as Christ appeared to him, he burned his footprints into the stone. And I saw the replica of this on the exact spot where they had built a church. You know the one. You probably know the one near Rome. Yes. I put my fingers down into each of these footprints of the Christ, and as I did so, I received the absolute charge up my arms, both of them through my physical body, through my heart, of the currents of Jesus Christ. I felt it. It was real and tangible. It was no imagination. It was electrical. And it was beneficial. And the, footprints. the footprints, yes. I did that too. Burned. Did you feel the currents? Yes. They're tremendous. I recommend that anyone put their fingers in there. If you're in the right spirit, you will feel the presence of God, as in the legend of Essa and the giant. The thing we have to understand is that we are living in a world where there is in existence now, in the whole educational process and the whole process of the church, which is also spiritually educative, there is a great manifestation of the ancient dragon, Tiamat, holding the world by the tail and shaking the stuffing out of everybody because, in effect, Tiamat is denying us access to the concepts of universal truth. And, in effect, that is what the Great White Brotherhood is all about. The Great White Brotherhood is the repository of the ancient Akashic records. In the great hall of cosmic mirrors, we see the perfect patterns of each individual soul on this earth. 
and all should understand this because through the gift of self we can attain our mastery. The first question you're going to ask me when you start to ponder this is, well, what about me? And rightly so. You can have this power, but of what value is any power if it cannot be used for salvation? We read where it says, with fear and trembling working out your salvation. And we understand fear and trembling as awe and respect for God and for Christ. Then, as we pause to consider this, we see that there is nothing to be lost by humility, but everything to be gained. For the Lord draws nigh to those that are humble, and he resisteth the proud who in their imaginations are covetous of the things of this world, while never willing to give themselves wholeheartedly to he who has given them everything and will give them everything in the future. We are not talking about a man. We are talking about a spirit. And the spirit is greater than the flesh. The spirit is the perfection of God that everybody can get, that everybody has, but doesn't recognize. Do you see? So, to bring this to a conclusion then, I will say that there are so many mysteries connected with self that my recommendation to everybody here is that you don't go ahead and get hung up on that, but just be a little child. Look at the sun and recognize that God is there and love is there. Look at life as an opportunity for that's what thunders, is the opportunity of life. That's what you're hearing. It's opportunity knocking at the door of your heart. And the rain that's coming down is the cleansing of God for everyone on this earth. He says, ho, everyone that thirsteth, the waters of life are here for all that want it and they start right within you. That's where the brook Kedron is, as far as I'm concerned. The waters of life, the spring of life, bubbles up within the soul. That's where God is, and that's where you are. You are a spirit, and by and by you shall know yourself even as you are known. And the gift of life will stand clear and pure to your gaze. That's all that we are concerned with, is that you understand that God loves you and that he has given you the gift of self and it's up to you to enhance the meaning day after day and night after night. For day after day uttereth speech and night after night uttereth knowledge. Thank you.